Okay. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Jillian Graber, Executive Director of Protect PT. Welcome to our virtual lunch hour. Um, we have virtual lunch hours every Thursday at noon. And today I'm uh, not in my office, I'm at home. So, uh, and we appreciate you guys joining us. We have John Detweiler today. He is, oh, and my screen moved. He is a, um, a retired, he, uh, retired from a career of engineering and business man management. He's a member of Marcellus Protest. And for the past 10 years, he's been working as a full-time volunteer uh, on the interlocking issues of fracking, environmental justice, and climate disruption. Before that, he was an owner and operator of an executive, an executive of a 100-person engineering and construction firm. Um, he's consulted for business strategy for corporations um, and government entities, and we want to welcome John with us today. We're going to talk today about the economics of fracking, and um, so thanks so much for being with us, John. I know this is a topic that a lot of people um, are interested in and has been a topic in the news recently, so that's one of the reasons why we wanted you to have have you come on and, and talk a little bit to us today. So thanks for being here. Thanks, Jillian. It's good to be with you and it's good to have even just a small part in all the work that you guys are doing. Well, do you sometimes feel like no matter how much evidence we collect, it can never be enough to put the brakes on fracking? Yeah. Well, I do. In fact, every year the compendium of scientific research gets longer. And now we've even found freaky cancers that kill our teenagers but fracking rolls on as if none of that counts for anything. So if you ask yourself, what force can keep fracking going in spite of all those good reasons that it needs to stop? Well, if your answer is money, you're not wrong. <laughs> but then after that one word, what more can you say? So the reason for this talk is to offer you some ideas for some serious conversations about money, about the economics of fracking. And we need to have those conversations because for years, we've been roped into this dead end argument about some kind of either or trade off. You know, will you give up a healthy economy for a healthy environment or do you want it the other way around? Yeah. And I've been in that argument too, but the setup is a phony choice because the economics of fracking are terrible and unsustainable. And if we can get unstuck from that false choice, our real choice is really pretty easy. If we picked fracking and rejected the environment, we'd lose on both ends of the deal. And yet, even now that mainstream media do run stories about the harms of fracking, they haven't stopped beating the drum for that big lie. You know how it sounds. Well, fracking may be destroying the environment, although of course it's good for the economy. Well, that's wrong and it needs to change. And I want to tell you why. Um, I've given presentations for a couple of years now explaining the finances of fracking, but yeah, sometime last year, the news media took interest in the subject because gas companies were suddenly cutting back, uh, closing offices, laying off people, some even declaring bankruptcy. So maybe you've already heard most of the basics. And in the hour that we have today, I'm going to skim very lightly over the financial background so we can talk together about those more recent developments. So if anybody would like to hear more about the fundamentals, we can bookmark that to follow up later. And I figure about a half hour just to lay out my case and then the rest of our time we can spend on discussion or questions or other topics. Um, I brought a few charts and graphs, but I won't go deep into any of them. So if you love charts and graphs, you might want to explore them further. And if you hate charts and graphs, you might want to just let them go by. But either way, you can take my word or not for what all those numbers mean. And we've also got a reading list, which I think we can post the link to because I didn't just figure this out by myself. So part one, the fracking phenomenon. Today, I'm gonna to go on saying fracking when what I really mean is natural gas fracking in Pennsylvania. But most of my conclusions really could apply to fracking for oil or to other parts of the country. And I call it the fracking phenomenon because you know, someday when people look back at fracking, they're gonna see it as just one episode in our history. The fracking phenomenon had a beginning and it will have an end. As a start date, I'd say, say uh, 2006 for that first frack well in Washington County. And the end date, well, we don't know yet. But I'm gonna show you some of those charts and graphs now. Um, let's see, this was a test pattern we don't need to look at anymore. 
<laughs> okay, here's a chart. Um, this is a chart of the number of new frack wells or spuds every year in, here in Pennsylvania. After that first single well in 2006, there were just four the next year. And then the rate of drilling shot up through 2011. There were over 1,800 that year. And the number hasn't been that high again since. We're going to see this chart again, but its overall shape looks like other booms in the past. The infancy is a mad dash. Everybody's trying to jump in on the action. Then comes maturity and some settling down to business. But then maybe sooner or maybe later, decline sets in and then collapse. And for a variety of specific reasons, the end. And then finally, in the aftermath, we are all left to deal with the consequences. This life cycle looks just like the timber boom, which we had until we wiped out the virgin forests, and the oil boom until we lost out to Texas and the Middle East, and the coal boom, and its aftermath, of course, has been the acid runoff and the blasted mountaintops. Well, we can recognize the shape of the fracking phenomenon, but we can't really predict how long each stage is going to last. And in fact, I drew it like this just to fit it on the slide. I, I think my maturity phase looks awfully short, but we'll have to wait and see. Each one of those stages, though, however long it lasts, has its own type of impact on everybody in the community. Today, I'm going to stick to an inside view, looking at the companies through the eyes of their managers and their investors. So in the infancy stage, the company's full-time goal is to grow as fast as possible. It's trying to establish a foothold and profitability hardly matters. For fracking specifically, this was that initial land rush when new players were signing up acreage and drilling just to hold by production. Well, then as a boom moves into maturity, the weaker competitors are weeded out and the survivors settle down to business. To management now, growth takes a back seat to predictability and cost control. This ought to be the prime of life, a safe choice for ordinary investors generating steady profits. But the dirty secret about fracking is that it didn't make that transition into mature profitability, and maybe it never can. I'm going to show you in the story of five companies. CNX, formerly Consolidated Coal, then Consul Energy, and they have the leases to drill at the Pittsburgh airport. Cabot Oil and Gas, EQT, which was once Equitable Gas and once the biggest gas producer in the United States, Range Resources, and Southwest Energy. Now these five are typical and there are other similar companies, but I picked these because they're active locally, they're public, and they're still in business. Here's the number of wells for each company. And together, those five account for just half, a little under half of all the wells in the state. Well, the punchline of this story is going to be what those companies have to show for their investors over the years. I'm going to put it in terms of the company's market capitalization or market cap. You might not have heard that term before, but it's just one quick way to put some sort of dollar figure on the value of a whole business. It's what you get if you multiply the company's stock price on any given day times the total number of shares in the hands of the stockholders. So here's my arithmetic. And on the day I made this slide, I get a combined market cap of $13.5 billion for the five companies. That $13.5 billion, in other words, is how much all the stockholders in those five companies would say is the value of the stock they hold. Well, here's the history of the market cap for the five companies stacked on top of each other. At their peak around 2014, the five companies together were worth to their shareholders worth over $85 billion. Today, as you've already seen, it's 13 and a half billion. The investors in these five companies have lost over 80% of their money. And this isn't some paper wealth I'm talking about. It's real money invested by real people 
for things like college educations or retirements or home improvements. But now, thanks to just these five companies, all those people have seen the value of their investments drop by more than $70 billion. Now that's money, incidentally, that would have been revenue to other businesses like universities and cruise lines and contractors if those investors hadn't put it into fracking. And you'll notice, by the way, that that red line for the S&P index, the stock market as a whole did pretty well over those years. But when we add the rest of the fracking industry in with my five companies, we find that fracking has destroyed nearly 300 billion in shareholder value. That's the economic legacy of the fracking phenomenon. And it's not even counting the dollar impacts on communities and farms and forests and all the health related costs and all the damages that money can't fix, but only harm to the people who put their money into this scheme. Hundreds of billions literally down a hole in the ground. Well, before I leave the slides for a while, here's one more piece of data. The purple line is the spot market price of natural gas. And I've just laid it on top of that same chart of new wells, those spuds. I'll talk later about the effect of gas prices on the profitability and even the viability of frac operators. So here's how that price has been trending. And the price is quoted in dollars per million BTUs, which is about the same as dollars per thousand cubic feet. When the fracking phenomenon began, natural gas had just been trading around $7 and even as high as 13. And it hit even higher peaks in the years just before 2006. But from 2009 onward, the spot price has hardly ever gone over $5. And it's typically been about half of that. Now the graph stops at 2019, but the spot price of natural gas in some markets actually went below zero in the spring of this year. I'm gonna put another bookmark here in case you wanna talk about hedging versus spot prices. And finally, speaking of profitability, here's how the price of gas tracks against the market cap of our five companies, which you've already seen. And you'll notice that they're pretty much going up and down together. So I'll show you one more look at this chart and then I'll tell you a story because it was only after I drew this chart for today's meeting that I realized it looked familiar like something out of my past. When I was a lot younger, I worked for a company that did risky multi-million dollar technology projects for industrial clients. This is before I had my own company. I got promoted from engineering to project management and my new boss explained that now I was gonna to need to work with people with very different skills than mine. He told me that every project would go through four stages and in each stage, a different skill set would be in the spotlight. Team one, as he put it, was sales. They had some grandiose vision of what we could do and they got the client to sign the contract. Team two was engineering where I had worked and we did our very best to deliver what the client was expecting. But at some point, team three took over. These were the finance people, the bean counters. And they decided when and how the project would end, even if we in engineering thought that we had more work to do. Well, I could tell them my boss wanted me to ask him about team four, so I did. And he said, oh, team four, that's the lawyers. After all your work is done, they pull out the contract and they settle all the claims and the counterclaims and they decide whether more money needs to change hands. And that's when we find out how you did. There's a parallel to fracking, of course. Team one, the hyperactive salespeople, they're gone already. You can think about Aubrey McClendon and Katie Kleber. Since then, the fracking team two has tried to make fracking work as promised. And now recently the financial people, team three, are coming forward to take charge. And finally, when the smoke clears, the lawyers will tell us how it all turned out. Well, by now, all of us are probably pretty familiar with the selling and the technology of fracking. So here's the financial angle in a nutshell. Fracking runs on debt. If you wanna get into this business, you can't just dip one toe in the water. Your very first well before you see a single cubic foot of gas takes millions of dollars. And most of that is literally sunk cost. You can't pull all that stuff out of the ground and take it on down the road and use it again. 
for your second well, you get out your checkbook and you pay it again and so forth. The gas companies refer to all this upfront spending as capital expense or CapEx. Well, what this means is that fracking has an insatiable appetite for money, well after well after well. Where does that money come from? Well, there are two basic sources or two types of money, if you will, equity and debt. Equity money comes from selling stock and debt comes from taking loans. In each of those sources, those kinds of money comes with its own set of expectations. Equity money is from shareholders, people who bought the company's stock and they wanna see growth so that their shares are worth more when the time comes to sell. And not only do shareholders worry about the future, they worry about the future future. That is, they're counting on someone someday to buy their shares, and they know that those someday buyers will in turn be worried about their own future. And in this business, the future, and especially the future future, depends on how much gas is still in the ground where the operator could drill someday. This is called the company's reserves. And reserve replacement, how to find more gas to make up for what you've just taken out of the ground, Reserve replacement is what keeps energy company executives up at night. Now, debt money, unlike equity, comes from lenders or creditors. And corporate bonds or notes are the most important form of debt. A bond has a principal loan amount, a specified payback date or the maturity date, and a rate of interest. The creditor, unlike the shareholder, doesn't worry about growth. They want their regular interest payment and they care whether the borrower, the fracking operator, will be able to pay back the principal when that maturity date arrives. Now, eventually a healthy company could pay for its capital spending, its CapEx, out of cash from its operations. That means selling enough gas at a high enough price to pay the bills, cover the loans and support ongoing CapEx. But until the company reaches this positive cash flow, management has to work to keep convincing both the shareholders and the creditors to keep that money flowing. Well, to do that, to make that sales pitch for more money, company executives make formal presentations to Wall Street analysts. And those analysts in turn influence the potential shareholders and lenders. So next, we're gonna look at a typical financial presentation. The operating data are interesting, but even more, I want you to see how the company spins that information to appeal to the audience that has the money. In fact, this spin is so important that fracking insiders have said, you know, this business isn't so much about extracting gas from the ground as it is of extracting money from the investors. Well, part three, plans and promises. I'm gonna show you just one company range resources as being representative of the others. And I'm gonna use their 2014 presentation. That's right at that $85 billion peak in the market cap drawing. We're gonna take a pretty deep dive here for a few minutes, but I promise to net it all out when we come back up. I've marked up this report to draw your attention to some of the details, but all the content is in range resources own words, just as they presented it to Wall Street that year. The very first page summarizes what range resources or range thinks the analysts want to hear. First, their reserves, their word is acreage. Second, growth. Third and fourth, cash flow and liquidity, both of which I'll be saying more about. But to look quickly at each of those. Acreage. On this next page, this map shows the range resources acreage in three different shale areas of the United States. And the text is telling the story that the gas in those acres provides range with reserves for many years to come. Then growth. This page shows that both the production, which is gas taken out of the ground, and the reserves, the gas that's still in the ground, have grown every year. And implicitly, it says that range can continue to grow both the production and the remaining reserves. And if that sounds to you like eating their cake and having it too, well, that's exactly what it is. And will there be more on that in a minute? Well, checking back to that first summary page for some of the other promises, positive cash flow. 
Notice that this is to be achieved two years into the future. Well, in the world of corporate spin, two years out is always the perfect place to stick a performance goal. It looks just far enough away to be feasible and just near enough to be encouraging. Then they mentioned liquidity, which they say as a strong balance sheet. So we'll take a quick look at that balance sheet. It shows that the company has $3 billion of debt and $3 billion in equity, the company's net worth. And it points to another $1 billion in liquidity, which means like they're a billion below the limit on their credit card. And there's detail on the next page. I told you this was going to be a deep dive to show that their $3 billion of debt that we just saw in the balance sheet comes due in 2019 through 2023. This is what the analysts call a maturity wall, as in hitting the maturity wall. And we're reading this, of course, when payback time has arrived. But remember, they said it back in 2014. So take a closer look back at that positive cash flow statement that they started with. And understand that Range is saying that beginning in 2016, they will begin to have more cash coming in than they have going out. That doesn't mean they'll be out of the hole. It means they'll have stopped making the hole deeper day by day. And then in 2016, they'll be able to start setting aside cash to use for that maturity wall that they're gonna hit in 2019. And to get them through the next couple of years until 2016, they've got a billion left on their line of credit and a whole lot of growing to do to bring themselves to positive cash flow, which brings us back to growth. And how does Range say that they're going to achieve that growth? Planned growth, 20 to 25% growth for many years. How about a sanity check? Can you think of a time when you've improved something by 25% better than it was before? Raised your grades, changed your diet, gotten 25% more sleep, put a 25% addition onto your house, whatever it was, could you do that again and again and again for many years as Range says? Well, on their next page, they've provided a graph of what 25% growth looks like on the production side of their company. And they've put in a helpful note, which I've highlighted, three to one increase in four years from 1 billion cubic feet per day to 3 billion, tripling the size of the whole business in four years. That's quite a management challenge, even if all the resources are all lined up and ready to roll. With three to one growth, where will all that gas go? Well, they've said more takeaway capacity, which means more pipelines, more demand from exports, petrochemicals, meaning plastic, power generation, meaning electric utilities, manufacturing, steel, and transportation, trucks and buses. Here's yet another bookmark for later discussion, if you like. Projected to grow is a slippery phrase but all of range resources reasons to project a higher demand carry a big factor of public policy. The Shell Cracker plant and the rest of the petrochemical value chain are maybe the most outstanding examples, but there are others. And where will all that gas come from? Well, to increase production, of course, you can drill more wells. But how do you extract more gas and also increase your reserves at the same time? Well, you can add acreage by finding it and signing up the landowners if no one else got there first. You can go deeper, say into the Utica below the Marcellus Formation, and you can be more optimistic about the acreage that you already own. And I'll bookmark that one too, in case you wanna come back to it. But this growth plan is quite a stretch even though management sounds pretty sure of themselves. But there's one more gotcha. Frack wells don't produce for very long. So while the company is trying to ramp up their production, the wells that they've already drilled are producing less and less gas every day. You know, the Red Queen said to Alice in Wonderland, here it takes all the running you can do just to stay in the same place. And range, gives us this type curve for their Marcellus wells right here in their presentation 
And again, they've added a helpful note, which I will highlight, down by 87% in the first year. And you can see that they've measured the life of their well in months. Well, there's more to see in this Wall Street presentation, but I think we have what we need to answer the question that I started with. Why does a fracker frack? Because they have to. It's a bit like the gambler who's in the hole with his bookie. He goes back out to the racetrack because he needs a winner. So even when the price of gas is too low to cover the cost of drilling, it does bring some cash in the door to pay off the vigorish on those outstanding loans while you wait for your luck to change. There are some other reasons too we could come back to, but for the operator, this means they're on the drilling treadmill and they don't dare to slow down. Well, we're done with the document from Range Resources and here are the takeaways that I promised, remembering that their presentation was made in 2004. Fracking operators are carrying lots of debt and to make the payments on their debt, they are compelled to keep drilling, even if the drilling costs more than the gas is worth. Every operator's first priority is to stay in business, just hoping to be among the survivors when the music stops. And across the industry then, all those operators fighting for survival have pushed the price of gas below break even for fracking's actual costs. And the industry is pinning its hopes on higher prices, looking to new customers, more pipelines, less competition and government help. And that last one means fewer regulations, faster permitting and subsidies along the whole natural gas value chain. As I've said, that plan is a very tall order and could go wrong in any number of ways. But remember, 2014 was supposed to be the prime of life. And here, Range Resources, like other frac companies, was still sucking down cash and paying off with promises. And we shouldn't be surprised that then their stock price was starting to skid. And before we go on, I should remind you that fracking companies were already in deep trouble last year before COVID-19. But we need to jump ahead now into the present day, part four, when the music stops. I wanna say a bit about bankruptcy just to set up our discussion. I'm sure that I'm an attorney, which I'm not, would explain it better, but this will give us some language that we can use, I think, even if it's just for today among ourselves. The first big idea to understand is that bankruptcy is not an event, it's a process. The process begins when a debtor, the fracking operator in our case, files for bankruptcy, which means asking the courts to invoke that legal process. Now you may have heard the expression filing for bankruptcy protection, but the second big idea of bankruptcy is that it's a process designed to operate for the benefit of the creditors, not the debtor, definitely not the public. And a third big idea related to that, which is the reason that the bankruptcy process has developed, is to avoid chaos when a debtor defaults. Because without bankruptcy, the first creditor who could get to the sheriff's office could make off with all the debtor's assets and leave the other creditors holding the bag. As I said, bankruptcy exists to protect the creditors. Now I can say more about what triggers a bankruptcy, but that'll probably make more sense after we look at how bankruptcy actually works. So here are the major steps in the process that happen more or less sequentially. First, all the creditors are stayed from taking action to enforce their loans. In other words, nobody takes anything. Then an executor is appointed by the court to gather all the facts, to make recommendations to the court on any decision that affects the creditors and then to carry out the court's instructions. Meanwhile, enough of the company management and staff are kept on so that these decisions can be implemented. Then the court decides which assets can be sold, if any, to raise money to pay debts and when and how those sales will happen. And often the existing creditors or new lenders will extend even more loans to the company so that it can keep operating during bankruptcy if in the court's judgment that will benefit the creditors. So the process, the process can play out in various ways, but in the end, some creditors may get all or most of what's owed to them. Other creditors will get much less than what they're owed. 
and the owners, that is the shareholders, might be wiped out completely. And what matters possibly most to us, the public, is that in order to raise money for the creditors, the assets of the business can be sold without the buyer accepting any responsibility that might be attached to the asset. And until the bankruptcy, that asset might have been someone's assurance that that responsibility would be honored. For example, coal companies have sold their mines at bankruptcy where the new owners get the mine, but they walk away from any benefits that the mine's workers and retirees were depending on. Once again, bankruptcy is for the creditors. And if a one-sided asset sale is what it takes to pay the creditors, then that's what it takes. So that's what happens in a bankruptcy process. As for what triggers it, call it insolvency. That just means that the company has run out of ready cash to make its loan payments or its payroll, although it might own plenty of non-cash assets. And the company might have been and, and probably has been reporting profits on a regular basis right up till the day it declared insolvency. That's because a profit in simple terms means that the company is worth more today than it was in the past. That is, its net worth, its assets minus its liabilities have gotten bigger. For a fracking operator though, their assets consist mostly of wells and reserves, neither of which is any good for paying bills, while its liabilities include a lot of bills. Well then, just as in the infancy phase, companies are managed for growth, and in the maturity phase, they manage for profitability. When team three, the financial people, see a storm coming, they manage for cash. So suppliers have to wait for payment, then offices are closed, people are laid off, even if that hurts efficiency, and assets are sold, all to conserve cash. It's like those old sailing days when they threw the cannons overboard to lighten the ship. It might hurt in the long run, but that doesn't matter unless you make it to the long run. And so if we looked at Range Resources, most recent Wall Street presentation, you'd see that those three big shale plays on the US map are now down to just one. The other two have been sold already. In fact, the last act just before insolvency is usually that the company seeing a cash squeeze coming was negotiating for a new loan and they didn't get it. Because as we've seen, Fracking hasn't ever been cash flow positive. So when loans mature, the operators have to roll them over into new and often bigger loans. Part five, what this means to us. I admit that it put a smile on my face when Chesapeake Energy filed for bankruptcy. But bad news for them is not necessarily good news totally for us. For one thing, any business failure takes money out of the economy. Investors and suppliers don't get what they've been counting on. And the domino effect means that other companies then also are put at risk. And then the assets of the bankrupt operator haven't gone away. All the active well sites, permits for more wells, leases and so forth have value for satisfying the creditors, which means they'll be sold. And the buyers of distressed assets are usually down market. That is even less well-funded or maybe less ethical than the owner who's in bankruptcy. And if a multinational energy company can't operate responsibly and still pay their bills, then what happens when somebody even lower in the food chain comes along to take their place? But what can be even worse as policy than seeing operators fail is to try to rescue them with public dollars or concessions. And as you can see, if we look back at range resources, ambitions for positive cash flow, almost every item on their wish list involved some form of public sacrifice, either explicitly or implicit. So to kick off our discussion time, Here's how I think we, all of us, can stay involved as this fracking financial landscape is shifting. Number one, don't relax. These business failures are an important sign of change, but they're not the end of the story. Number two, share the knowledge. 
talk about how fracking has been an economic failure. And three, push back against public investments and political concessions, concessions for fracking itself and for the rest of the whole fracking value chain. Otherwise we're throwing good money after bad and public money and the end isn't gonna change. We're just throwing our money down the hole after the investors. So this last item might be a good place to start our discussion. And I'd like to hear where all of you on, are on that topic. So I'm gonna stop here and turn the program back to Jillian. Thanks, John. Um, yeah, and, and actually one of the reasons that I wanted you to come on today um, is because I was at a presentation that you gave a couple of years ago, and this is before COVID, um, and you were talking about um, the, the economics of fracking. And one of the things that kind of struck me um, was you had said that, that fracking is like a sick night. Can you kind of describe that again? Say that again, because it, it was really impactful yeah. to me. And it might well, you know, we, <laughs> we, we've been fighting fracking for so long that, that maybe we give them more credit than they deserve. But first of all, to be honest, that, that's a phrase that was in a, a, a John le Carré book that I had read maybe just before I gave that talk. And he was talking in his mystery, his, you know, his spy story about the Soviet Union in the, the 1980s or maybe the late 70s, whatever that was, and saying yeah, the, the, the knight inside the arm, the, the, the knight in armor looks very formidable. But if you could see inside the armor, you would see that the knight inside is very sick. Um, I don't know whether fracking is any sicker than it was when it started but it's not as strong as we give it credit for. Um, and again, that's not totally good news because you know you could make an analogy to wounded animals or something like that. So um, I'm not saying that they won't fight back, but but they're they're not invincible. Yeah, and and maybe that's why we do see them fighting back so much because um, you know we you know we in the community from a community perspective we don't want them to come into our town and uh, wreak havoc. We want them to, you know, if they're, if they're going, if it's going to be, if it's going to happen, which most likely it will, it's an uphill battle for any community to, to fight this type of, you know, large entity and um, this type of production. We want, we want them to do it as responsible uh, as possible. And, and that, uh, will cost them a lot more money. And so you can see why, based on your presentation, that they don't want to do that. They they want to get out in and out as, as quickly and cheaply as possible, which is why we see all of the harms happening to people, um, you know, because of faulty liners that were properly installed, because of, um, you know, the, the fracking fluid interacting with the pressure um, and, and a casing failure. And so you know, I, I think that somebody needs to really analyze when, if, when, if this is all said and done, this fracking boom, um, how much destruction has actually been made uh, and what the true cost of that destruction is. Because, you know, if you think about, you know, you, you'd mentioned CNX being one of the biggest um, companies, they actually, um, uh, January 2019, they had a big incident at the Beaver Run Reservoir. That reservoir right. is the water source, the public water source for 130,000 people here in, in Westmoreland County. And um, so they had this, this incident that happened and it could have been prevented. And actually they just settled earlier this week with the DEP, we right. found out. So they settled with the DEP um, to a tune of, I think it was $175,000 um for for that pretty instance. much a tap on the wrist yeah right right and so um you know they they are in the situation where now they're going to be starting to to frack again they're actually completing another well that they had that planned to do uh, before this incident happened so why do we see the continued investment if if this is like if the hole keeps getting bigger and you have to you know, you have to drill and frack more just to keep yourself, try to dig yourself out of that hole. Why do then new investors come on and say, well, I'll take on that, that risk. 
you know, like we see some of these companies going bankrupt and we see news of these big new investors investing in the companies. Why would they do that? Well, part of it, I think, is consolidation that, uh, you know, the, the whole industry has been for years hanging on, hoping for higher prices. And so as consolidation happens, in theory, at least, a few bigger companies, but smaller in number, have more negotiating power than a bunch of small companies who are all fighting to be the last one standing. So there's pressure for consolidation in hard times. There's also a, an opportunity for somebody who has deep pockets to think that they can pick up assets cheaply. So okay. it's cheaper to buy somebody else's well when they are in bankruptcy than it is to drill your own well. So, you know, every crisis for somebody is an opportunity for somebody else. Uh, so that's part of the dynamic going on. Um, I, I think the other thing, though, that we really do need to be active around is that uh, there's a political story that has been cultivated over the years, which is that this is a great industry and we should do everything we can to help it. And so, uh, you know, for example, there's the, the energy independence myth hmm. saying that fracking is really great because it's making us energy independent. And if you look at where the investment is actually being made, it's being made in pipelines to take the gas somewhere else for hopefully hoping that somebody else will pay a higher price for it because the price in the US is so uh, depressed by all of these companies. So I think, you know, if we had some honest policy discussions, and this is not simple, um, I'm, I'm not claiming that I have an answer that, that is going to solve the whole thing, but it is complicated. And, and I think if we had a more honest public dialogue, you know, and, and could get some of our elected officials and other people, uh, including mainstream media, to the extent that there are any, um, you know, to, to deal with the complexities, uh, we could make some of the trade-offs uh, uh, better. Uh, one other just side comment. I mentioned that the companies manage for cash in a crisis and they cut back on all kinds of things. I think what they probably don't cut back on very much is lobbying because <laughs> at, at times like this, the dollar that you spend on lobbying probably pays a much higher return than the dollar that you would spend on engineering or anything else. Yeah. So, uh, you, you know, you see in Harrisburg that uh, there's a big pressure to, to save the fracking industry. And uh, there are also other people, including me, that say, no, that's, that's just throwing good money after bad. Right. Um, I, I had, if I could just throw in one more uh, sure. Example. I talked to a woman in, a, she's from a small town in Kentucky, and they're struggling like that part of Appalachia is. And she's had a whole lot more experience with financial problems and health problems and drug problems and so forth than I would ever want to have. But she's the one who said this in her words. And she said, you know, this gas industry it's kind of like opioids. We're afraid of what's going to happen when we stop. Mm -hmm. And we know that it's going to be awful when we stop and we're frightened. And so we keep doing it and keep doing it and keep doing it. And if we really knew what was best for ourselves, we'd stop. So it's a drug addiction. It's, it's an addiction. Uh -huh. It's a, yeah, I, I, has, I hesitate to say that, and I emphasize that it's her words because <laughs> yeah, right. th those aren't words that I've earned the right to use. But that was her example. I've heard the I've heard the addiction. Um, I've he I've heard that before, um, especially when we're talking about um, you know new products <laughs> as a result of fracking. So new products being things like plastics, you know, um, since there is no, you know, this, since the market price is so low for, for fracked gas, uh, for, for natural gas, um, uh, you know, a lot of companies are, are going to plastics and, and making plastics. And uh, that's mm -hmm. how the beaver cracker plant, you know, is, right. is existing right. because of, of that. It's like, so we don't have a, we don't have a, 
you know, a demand for our product. So we're going to try to get to, to make a new right. product. And that's what they've done. Essentially, right. they're making a new product and right. uh, they are they are um, feeding the the addiction and dependency that um, Americans especially have on plastics. Mm-hmm. You know, we um, Americans use a lot of plastic uh, it was touted for, you know, a number of years by the, um, you know, by the lobbying companies, uh, you know, American Petroleum Association, I think it's called, um, and others to, that say that, you know, plastic is, is the best thing, like the best invention that man's ever made um, because it can never deteriorate. It can never break down. But I think, you know, in hindsight, a lot of people are realizing that that's not necessarily a good thing. <laughs> um, <Yeah. laughs> and, and, and the same economic arguments really just move right down the line to the cracker plant and then from the cracker plant down to the plastic manufacturing and, and so forth it is that plastic or polyethylene, for example, which is what they're doing at the, at the shell plant or what they will plan to be doing at the shell plant. The polyethylene capacity in the world is overbuilt. The price of polyethylene is depressed because there are so many people in the polyethylene business and they have spent billions and billions of dollars to build these plants, which now are capable of producing far more polyethylene than anybody needs. And so there's more money being pushed at, and this is public money again, you can see it in Harrisburg, being pushed at somebody downstream of the shell plant to start using more polyethylene and develop more products. So while it's true that we as consumers use a lot of plastic, I don't think anybody came forward and said, you know, would you please replace the wax paper in my cereal box with a plastic liner? (laughs) Somebody who makes plastic said, you know, I'll bet you if we went after those cereal boxes, we could sell some plastic film to the cereal people. That's right. That's and right. so it's a push process. It's not because we're demanding stuff. It's because the people who make it need some place for it to go. Yeah, they, they need and to push their product. Same argument. Yeah. <laughs> so you look down the line, you know, when our kids were little, there was some song about the woman who swallowed a fly and then she <laughs> swallowed a spider to catch the fly and then she swallowed a bird and so forth. And it just seems like, you know, to bail out the frackers, we need to build a cracker and to build, bail out the cracker, we need to build something <laughs> else and so forth and so on down the line. You know, and meanwhile, there's some poor whale out in the, at the end of this, this whole process that's getting all the stuff that we've made. Yeah, I think they're somewhere in that rhyme. It's I don't know why she swallowed the fly. Right. I don't know why yeah. they built the cracker, but they did. And, and now we're all we, suffering we, for it. <laughs> well, and, and when that cracker, when there was a competition for the shell plant and Ohio and West Virginia and Pennsylvania were all trying to attract the cracker plant and Pennsylvania put together the winning package. If you consider this winning the concessions and the tax breaks and so forth that Harrisburg gave to shell because we said we needed those jobs pay for every single job that's going to be at that cracker plant when they open for the, the rest of its useful life. Every one of those jobs working at the cracker plant is gonna be a publicly funded job. And we could have hired first responders or teachers or nurses yeah. with that same money instead of people to make plastic, which then we have to find somebody to buy. Right, so when people talk about um, you know, the welfare or, or giving, giving away money for socialism. I, I hear this a lot, um, especially yeah. now with, with the politics being the way they are. Um, you know, isn't that a form of, of, you know, giving, this give, they're giving away our money. We didn't, we didn't say yes to that. Uh, we didn't right. say, sure, go ahead. Um, <laughs> give those. And the municipalities shell. in the Ohio Valley, yeah. you know, are, are seeing their tax money being given away by you know people that don't you know that they had no say in whether some of these investments were going to be tax free and it's in it's in their tax base that these things are happening so, yeah at some point you know. think that somebody would think to themselves this is a really convoluted plan i i don't know um yeah. why this is happening um we do have a question from the audience um 
and it's from Patricia. Um, she was uh, uh, she was going to ask about political involvement and how to make the importance of science and energy dependent independence a priority. So how to make science a priority and ener and true energy independence, not the energy independence that the fracking industry um, is uh, saying is going to happen is really a myth. Um, mm -hmm. So how how mm -hmm. do we how do we get the political will? I think you know behind those topics mm -hmm. instead yeah. of fracking. Yeah. Well, again, I don't think that there is an easy answer, but uh, I think the the place that we can have the most influence is locally, um, and that there we can meet with people and we can you know have a face to face discussion. We can be uh, real people that they know, and we can bring information to them. Uh, with respect to the the cracker plant itself, uh, there has been a good financial analysis of the risks to the cracker plant and the, the the danger of spending more public money on the cracker plant. And there was a letter that was written by uh, university people, researchers, and scientists and sent to the governors of the three states, Ohio, West Virginia, Pennsylvania. And it got a good amount of traction in the public press. Usually when academics speak, you know, the reporters aren't interested, but, but there was a lot of coverage of that. Um, so I, I think that's an area that we really should push on locally and uh, at the state level. Uh, in Pittsburgh here, you know, our mayor came out uh, on his own against building more cracker plants and he was given a lot of grief for that. And I think we can do a better job of supporting people like that when they do step out. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, I was there when he said that. And I was stunned that he said that. And, and I, the whole room stood up and, and cheered. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then some people said, okay, well, that's great to say. But how is he going to take action to, to kind of put action behind those words? Right. And, um, you know, uh, there's, there's, I think he did. Yeah, you know, I, I think, uh, so, and if Pittsburgh doesn't vote on the cracker plant, really even Allegheny County doesn't vote on right. the cracker plant, but he, he took a big risk and I think he's paid a price for it and he got it on the agenda. He got people arguing about it, even if not all of them agreed with him. So I think some of the reasons for him st uh, taking that position got out. And as I said, he, he broke with the rest of the party locally to say that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, as mayor of Pittsburgh, does, does he get to sign something that builds a cracker or doesn't build a cracker? Probably not. But as mayor of Pittsburgh, you know, he, he did do something. Yeah. Uh, he, he got up and said something and for a politician, you know, that that's a price. Yeah, yeah, and I we commend him for that. Um, we did then, and and we do now because we we stand behind that that message. Um, so, are there any companies that have had that positive cash flow? Are there any companies where pe the investors, all of the investors, have had that return on investment, or is it? Are they all? They've all lost money. I don't know of any that have made money consistently. There's a report out the, about uh, fracking in Appalachia that says overall Appalachia has not had positive cash flow in any of these years. Wow. And it, in that report, it says it, it allows for the possibility that one or more of those companies might have had a year of some positive cash flow, but no, it's a systemic problem. It's not that one company is badly managed and, and not doing as well as it should be doing. The, the situation is one where you know, uh, it's not a good, way, good place to be trying to make money. Right. Um, and in that context, maybe it's worth saying that, as I said, the, the fracking companies know that they need much higher prices in order to survive. And yet, when we talk about uh, increasing the consumption of gas with things like cracker plants, 
those are predicated on low gas prices. And that's part of the situation with the shell plant is that the, the hope for the shell plant being uh, profitable is that it can get cheap gas. <laughs> and meanwhile, we're saying, well, man, as soon as the shell plant opens up, frackers are going to be doing fine. Well, they can't both do fine. Because right. one of them needs a high price, the other one needs a low price. Wow. I think we've got structural issues that nobody's being honest about. Yeah, I I think that's a really great takeaway. Um, and just to kind of sum up before we move on to the last part of the slides. Um, so thank you, Mary. She's on the back end. She was she put up this Institute for Energy Economics and Financial <clears throat> Analysis right. report um, from the Cracker Plant. So you can check that out. The link is on your screen now. Um, <clears throat> and a, a couple takeaways that that I see are that you know that that fracking is a, a house of cards, and that um, there's there's no way for fracking to make money. Um, and, and the people that are making money are, are the people that are the, are, are the only people that are benefiting are, are the people that actually own the companies or, or run the companies that are, that are getting a paycheck for doing the job and doing it really poorly, um, from all of the, the DEP <laughs> and other, um, you know, agencies that, that have been fining, um, these, these, these fracking companies. Um, I should say that the, the subcontractors are also making probably a tremendous amount of money as well, because, you know, all of this work is subcontracted out. Yeah. Yeah. Halliburton, Halliburton, which was the big one that everybody talked about, of course, that essentially invented the commercial side of the process has been laying off people. The other thing that I, let me just throw in real quickly. Yeah. The CEOs and top executives of these companies have been getting bonuses even this year, even as the companies are going down the drain, because as it turns out, in this industry, the way that executives are compensated is relative to the rest of the industry. And so if your company is going broke slower than the other company, you get a big bonus. Wow. So if you're doing less worse, <laughs> right. less right. bad. If you're, the, than... if you're the best of all the bad companies, you're doing a great job. <laughs> That's messed up. Um, John, would you mind going to the next slide for me? Um, uh, here we are. Yeah. So the, we, we started this, this lunch hour, um, you know, several months ago when COVID started as a way to, to help, um, connect the work that we're doing with, um, you know, with, with our constituents when our office was closed, our office is open. Um, we, you can go in, um, but we ask you wear a mask and, and we're taking safety precautions and our staff is limited there. So we only have one staff member there, um, sometimes two, um, depending on the day. And, um, but what, what we want people to realize is that this is another way to connect with us as well as what it's turned into is just a, a phenomenal way for us to connect with folks like John and others that have been guests on our virtual lunch hour where we can really discuss topics that are important right now. Um, you know, this is this is a huge topic right now in the news and it, and it has been a huge topic for us as far as, you know, going up against a company um, that has so much money, so much power. You know, we, we go into a, a public hearing with these, with these, uh, folks and they've got five, six, seven lawyers and we've got one. And so <laughs> we, uh, we know it's an uphill battle, but, but I, again, I have to stress that for, for communities like ours and communities fighting fracking, the most important thing to us is that the humans that have to live near this are protected. And that is just simply not happening. No matter how much money they're making or losing, that is not happening. So that I want to just make sure that that's part of the discussion. And um, for folks to look at the Attorney General's report um, and the, the grand jury report that came out, um, you can find information about that. You can find information about um, CNX and, and they're, they're um, drilling again or they're fracking again at our public water source. 
uh, and the information on that on our website, protectpt.org. And um, please subscribe to our virtual lunch hours. Um, we are going to take a break in October, but we're going to have some really strong lunch hours until then. We've got uh, some great guests coming up. Justin Noble from Rolling Stone is going to come on in a couple weeks. And uh, please take our survey. And John, if you would pop to the next screen. Um, next week, we're actually going to be talking about youth organizing. We had some wonderful youth organizers on uh, in the be uh, really close to the beginning of what we were when we were doing our virtual lunch hour. But we have a new program, um, and it's for it's to teach youth how to resist this type of thing if they want to make change in their community and it doesn't have to be just you know resist you know maybe somebody wants to fight fracking that's coming into the community that's wonderful but it will also teach them you know let's say they want to try to get single use plastics out of their school um let's say they want to um you know um work on a, a campaign to help their their community be healthier because the air emissions are so bad from a steel mill or so, something like that. So it, it doesn't matter. We, we are letting the, the, the students, they are going to be um, driving this. They are going to be um, coming up with these ideas on their own. We are just going to be supporting them. So we're going to have our launch on September 11th and next week we're going to be talking to some folks about that. Um, so check out our um, youth launch. It's a bit.ly that's up on the screen and um, it, sign up for the, the webinar on September 11th because it's going to be really great. Uh, so if you have a kid or know a kid that is interested in, in learning about this, um, you know, studies have shown that the kids that get involved in the community, in civics, in learning about how to organize um, for change in their community uh, are, are more successful adults, more successful in college and in their career. So we are really hoping to help mentor some, some wonderful youth to, to take action in their community. And for the benefit of our earth, because <laughs> we all live here and they're going to live here longer than we are. So <laughs> we want to thank John for being here today and for sharing your knowledge with us. I, I have so many notes that I wrote down. This will be available on our YouTube. <laughs> it will live there. Um, so thank you so much, John, for sharing your knowledge. We really appreciate Happy it. Happy to do it. It's good to, good to be with you. <laughs> all right. Take care, guys, and we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.